Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. Today is November 7th, 2020. Let's talk boxing. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Just a few quick words on Canelo. I see that he's now a free agent. Uh, he's left Golden Boy. He no longer owes matches to the zone. Um, he is free to do what he wants. So, in the community section, I've listed a poll on what he should do. Whether he should talk with lucrative free agents from the past and present, Floyd Mayweather and Mikey Garcia. Whether he should start his own promotional company for himself and others, right? Understand, it all hinges on content. He is one of boxing's box office gods, right? So he could conceivably start a promotional company. A lot of fighters would love to be on his cards. He's generating cash flow, right? Sets up the business, then, of course, has CEO responsibilities and can have a business that survives his career. Another option is to talk with another promoter, right? Lord knows this business has some guys who have been at it a long time. Bob Arum in top rank. He could even talk with advisors, Al Heyman, who famously advised Floyd Mayweather, who made hundreds of millions of dollars. Another option is to break from the status quo entirely, right? Sign up with Nike. Become Boxing's Tiger Woods, right? Have a new group in, advertising to a new crowd. Understand, Nike has a lot of superstar athletes under its banner, including LeBron James, right? Do commercials with LeBron. Bring in more fans. Be unique. Stand out. Well, let me, um, some of you have had other Ideas, they're posted in the community section of youtube.com slash Dwyer70905. Okay, fair enough. My own preference is that he, wait a bit, right? He's a free agent now, a lot's happening in the world. My suggestion is that he take at least seven figures. Throw it at Bitcoin, which is making a move right now. Right? Throw it at Bitcoin. See where it is six months from now. Let the game come to you, as Tika Tawari, financial advisor, likes to say. Right? Let me just tell you, I was raised watching boxing, and there were some kings of the ring at the time. Guys with a lot of swag who won some big fights, who wore some belts, who they can't interview today. Because the fighter has been beaten up so badly that he has slurred speech. My roommate, an American guy from college, right? My roommate in college heard Joe Fraser once give an interview. And he turned to me and he said, I didn't know Joe was Jamaican. Joe wasn't Jamaican. Joe was just slurring his speech. Think about some of the greatest fights of the last, oh, 30 years, 40 years, right? Understand, Ali, Fraser, neither's with us anymore. Understand, we know now that Joe Fraser was blind in one eye when he retired. Ali, if you recall the Atlanta Olympics, lit the torch. Now, understand, that Atlanta Olympics game was from the 90s. Right, the 90s. And even then, you'll notice Ali's other hand was shaking like this. Right, folks, that was decades before Ali passed. The point I'm making is simply that you could be a great fighter, a Hall of Fame fighter, an elite fighter, and get hit in the head so many times, or have a body that starts to show the effects of the sport after you've left the ring to such an extent that those last few fights really aren't worth it. 
Understand, you're placing your health at risk when you enter the ring against a world-class opponent. Right? Many of the guys who you just imagine living great lives, right? Guys who were young wearing belts. Wilfred Benitez, for example, uh, are nowhere to be found now, right? They're struggling. They're not doing well. So if I'm Canelo, and understand, Canelo has made millions of dollars, even under the contractual arrangement that he's now free of with Golden Boy and Golden Boy's deal with DAZN. Canelo made millions of dollars. Well, what I want people to do is to just understand where we are in the world of finance. There's a podcast. I believe it's called We Study Billionaires. Their current guest this week is the head honcho at Real Vision, former hedge fund manager Raul Paul. Now, in that podcast that you could get free of cost at podcast.google.com. Again, it's podcast.google.com. Just Google We Study Billionaires. Just Google Raul Paul. It'll pop up. Right? In that podcast, Raul Paul is going to make the case that Bitcoin right now, and it's over $14,000 a coin, Right? Bitcoin right now is severely underpriced, as it is right now, as an asset class. It's eating the lunch of the financial sector. In fact, it's doing well against gold. Right, My point to you is if Bitcoin is underpriced, if Canelo can turn a million dollars into really a long-term annuity, That's kicking him back millions and millions of dollars long term. And if he can do this without risking his health, he's a husband, he's a father, right? If he can back away from the sport after, let's be clear here, a Hall of Fame career, understand there's some esteemed members of the boxing public. Abel Sanchez comes to mind, right? Former trainer of Terry Norris, former trainer of Gennady Golovkin who firmly believes that the best fighter today in the sport pound for pound is Saul Alvarez. Understand Saul Alvarez really has nothing else left in the sport to prove. He's already a multi-division champion. He only lost to one guy. And in that fight, one of the judges, and I disagreed with the judge, but it's part of the historical record, one of the judges had that fight a draw. And his opponent that night was Floyd Mayweather. That's his only loss officially. Right? So understand, if he walks away from the sport right now, keeping in mind that Marvin Hagler walked away from the sport at 32. Understand, Canelo certainly is a Hall of Famer. Canelo certainly is a multimillionaire. I'll agree. In the short term, he's leaving money on the table. Because, of course, every fight Canelo has is worth millions of dollars right now. But in the long run, he'd have more time to spend with his kids. His health won't be at risk. And I'm just telling you, it's possible that Bitcoin, which a lot of very savvy people, not just for old Paul, Google Tim Draper's comments on Bitcoin. Michael Saylor's comments on Bitcoin. Jack Dorsey's comments on Bitcoin. It's possible that a million dollars in Bitcoin today could be worth substantially more than that, and all Canelo would have to do to have that asset, to have those future cryptocurrency appreciations, would be to invest. So if I'm Canelo, I'm not signing any contract too quickly. I'm making an investment. I'm sitting back. I'm with my wife. I'm with my kids. I'm with my family. I'm with my friends. Don't get me wrong. I'm also in the gym because I'm going to hedge it. I'm not going to completely go the Andy Ruiz route, right? I'm going to stay in shape just in case I decide to continue my career. Right, But I take some time off from the sport. I throw some money at Bitcoin, 
money I'm prepared to lose. I throw that at Bitcoin, not any other altcoin, right? It's Bitcoin with the infrastructure, with the institutional curiosity about it, right? With the hash rate that makes it hard to hack. I throw some money at Bitcoin and I sit there and I watch it. If it appreciates greatly in value, then I'm no longer a fighter. If I have the Jones to stay in the sport, and the reason I say that is, let's face it, if you're an investment type, the sport of boxing might not have the greatest rate of return. That might be elsewhere. Right? But if I have the Jones to stay in boxing because boxing's been good to me, then at that point, I can start that promotional company. But know that I'm not going to be the hired help in it. Right? I could manage fighters. I could invest in somebody else's promotional company. Right? Understand, a lot of billionaires, they don't want the exposure, the problems, the time commitment that comes with running their own company. You have a lot of people who are investors who enjoy investing in other people's businesses. Right? If Canelo waits six months after making a crypto investment and watching it, I believe he'll hold even more cards in six months' time than right now. Let's talk about one of the major fights in the heavyweight division. It happened... A little over a week ago, I believe it's a very important fight. Now, longtime subscribers know that I believe that we're having a cruiserweight invasion of the heavyweight division. That different fight styles will triumph in different fight climates. Right now, we're in a big clunky era. You're watching a Deontay Wilder fight, and there's hardly any volume. The whole fight is him trying to set up a long right hand, right? You watch an Anthony Joshua fight, and you realize Joshua is a puncher. He's not a boxer in the pocket, right? In the pocket, you start to notice some, some issues, right? Punching power with both hands, very dramatic, but there also might be stamina problems there. You notice that he did move in that Andy Ruiz rematch. But you noticed that when he was on the move, the power was gone, wasn't it? There's even the school of thought that he might have chin problems, right? Bob Arum is going around saying, hey, Andy Ruiz was not a puncher. I know because I used to promote him, right? Well, Andy Ruiz knocked down Anthony Joshua several times. We know Dylan White knocked him down in the amateurs. We're hearing stories about him getting knocked down and sparring by people like David Price. Right now, that's the world we live in. We also live in a world where Tyson Fury openly admits his toughest fight was against Steve Cunningham. In other words, agile, smaller fighters seem to give Tyson Fury problems. Right? If you're wooden and stiff like Vladimir Klitschko was, okay, you were sitting duck for Tyson Fury. But if you're mobile, if you can move a little bit, if you're hard to find, if you can find Tyson Fury as he moves around the ring, if you can dodge his jab, maybe you can cause him some problems. Now, one of the best fighters in the sport, let's be clear here, this guy, if he quit today, would have my vote for the Hall of Fame. Not that I have a vote, but he'd have my vote. And that's Alexander Usyk. Understand, he's unbeaten. He's an Olympic gold medalist. More importantly, not only was he a champion at cruiserweight, he was undisputed at cruiserweight. Right? He's like Terrence Crawford. Understand, we see him today. He's fighting as a heavyweight, folks. This is his second act. He's already shown Hall of Fame dominance in another weight class, collecting belts. He beat Maris Breedis. 
Right? Think about that. Maris Breeders just won the Muhammad Ali Trophy. He beat Breeders in Breeders' backyard. Not only that, as you comb through his past, you're going to find out that he's already beaten Joe Joyce in the amateurs, right? Or pseudo professional league. He's already beaten Michael Hunter. So, he fought a fight style that would be one of the hardest fight styles for him to deal with in the heavyweight division. It's counterintuitive. I know Derek Chisora had nine losses going into the bout. No question about it. But what I want you to do is, I want you to realize that at heavyweight, Usyk has a decided foot speed advantage coordination advantage, even though he's in his 30s now. He's like 33 on the big clunky heavyweights. In other words, he's a left-handed. And understand, he's 6'3". This is not a small man. He was two inches taller than Derek Chisora. This is a left-handed Muhammad Ali. Right? He's moving around the ring. That's his game. He wants you to move with him. He's not getting hit because he's moving. He has hand speed, doesn't rely on it as much as Ali. Right? Doesn't rely on his jab as much as Ali did because he's a southpaw. The angles are different. He doesn't have to do some of the things Ali did. Now, what I want people to do is to look at Ali hard here. Ali had the same problem that Tyson Fury has. Understand, the fighters who gave Ali the most problems weren't the big guys. It wasn't Cleveland Williams. It wasn't Sonny Liston, who wasn't that big, but who fought big. He was supposed to be big, bad Sonny Liston, right? Knocked you out, hit you with jabs, stuff like that. Those weren't the guys who gave him problems. The guys who gave him problems were the guys who could fight small or who were small, right? Joe Fraser, Joe's sparring partner, Kenny Norton. Right? Understand, these guys weren't big and trying to track you down and hunt you down like Anthony Joshua. Right? No. Look at Kenny Norton. He's small. He's, he's all folded up. Look at Joe Fraser. Joe Fraser, smaller man to begin with, is bobbing and weaving. He's bending at the waist. Just hitting Joe Fraser in the body. Took a lot of work because the guy was so low. Those are the kind of guys who gave Ali problems. Well, Derek Chisora at six one and a half is the kind of fighter. He's coming forward, he's coming in low, he's throwing volume. Right? He's trying to fight Usyk. He's not trying to box Usyk. He's throwing punches at odd angles, like Kenny Norton, right? Usyk's a technician. Usyk would have a straight punch block, not a punch at an awkward angle. That's who Usyk just fought. Now, let me just point out, Chizora's right hand is landing, folks. It's landing. Usyk can't figure out the angles. You know, elite fighters have plan A, plan B, plan C. The really good ones, Canelo, for example, right, know how to throw wide punches because sometimes it takes wide punches. Derek Chisora comes out, wins the first round, looks to be too strong for Usyk, who's on his back foot. Right concedes the first round. Chisora has no fear of Usyk's power. 
None whatsoever. Usyk is a slow starter as it is. You might remember Tony Bellew looking good early in, in their fight, right? Well, understand, Derek Chisora comes out, wins the second round. Chisora can actually move with Usyk. That's something I don't think Deontay Wilder or Anthony Joshua can do. Joshua was at the fight. Not surprisingly, after the fight, Joshua started talking about how he wanted the WBC belt that Tyson Fury had. Understand, I believe Usyk is now the mandatory for one of Joshua's belts. Folks, I'm just here to tell you, Joshua's not going to be undisputed, at least not anytime soon, because he would prefer to fight Tyson Fury rather than Usyk. Now, I don't blame him. I don't blame him. Right? The bottom line is, boxing's a young man's game. You're in it for the money. You're in it for the prestige. Fighting the lineal. A guy who has a belt in a unification match is a hell of a lot more prestigious than fighting a cruiserweight who's new to the division who doesn't have a belt right now in the division. Right? Get the payday. Get the glory. I'm not blaming him. But more importantly, after looking at this Chisora fight, and Usyk wins it, Usyk comes back from a deficit. But understand how the fight could have been different. Usyk even hits the canvas in the fourth round. Of course, the referee, and I believe correctly, called it a slip. Their legs got tangled up. But had he called that a knockdown, Given that, in my opinion, Chisora won the first two rounds, folks, that's a four-round, four-round block there. That even though Usyk was winning the boxing rounds, he would have had to have climbed out of that. Right? Understand, too, there are times in this fight where Derek Chisora is bone-tired. But yet you never got the feeling that he was in danger of getting knocked out. Right? Contrast this fight with the David Hay Chisora fight. Where you're watching that fight, Derek Chisora is on his front foot, he's pressing David Hay, but there's always that danger. It's implicit in the fight that Hay's going to turn over a right hand and end it. And he does. Here, you never got that risk. Right? Usyk's punch didn't show itself in the Derek Chisora fight. Let me just um, make some points here. Right? Against a taller fighter, one who can't hide his head as well as Derek Chisora can, I believe you would have noticed Usyk's jab. Again, understand, Chisora, in my opinion, was a tougher matchup for Usyk than either Joshua or Wilder would be. I'd take Usyk over both, especially since I believe the casino would make the other guys the favorites. Right? Usyk does better against bigger, clunky guys than he would a 6-1 aggressive Derek Chisora. Let me make a few other points. Usyk knows how to clinch. There are times in this fight where Chisora catches up with Usyk on the ropes. Usyk wisely comes in and clinches him in such a way that he ties up one of Chisora's hands. Then he has his hand up here so he can't get hit in the head. Right, folks, this is a highly advanced fighter. You can tell a lot about a fighter by how he moves and how he clinches. Usyk's exemplary at both. What Derek Chisora needed to do to slow him down, since Usyk is going a lot to his right, is it would have been great if Derek Chisora would have been able to get his left leg outside of Usyk's right leg to block him. Now, don't get me wrong. Usyk can go the other way, too. But what Chisora should have done in cutting off the ring is at least 
force Usyk to go one way, not both ways, right? Let me uh, say this, too. You know, Usyk is a master at stepping back, right? He throws punches. His defense, a lot of it, is him stepping back and having the punch stop before it gets to him. So what a fighter needs to do, and I just don't think Wilder or Joshua can do this. I don't think they have the coordination. What a fighter has to do is to force Usyk, you know, not engage on the way in, rather come all the way up to Usyk, leaving him very little room to maneuver, have him relatively close to the ropes before they start to throw punches. I want people to revisit the Gervonta Davis, Leo Santa Cruz tape, where Davis is letting Santa Cruz throw punches, and you'll notice Davis is aware of the spacing. He gets Santa Cruz over by the ropes, and Davis is judicious in his punches, right? In other words, he comes in, he has his hands up. He's blocking some shots on the way in. But he doesn't want the exchange to start until he's given Santa Cruz reduced space to operate in. That's crucial when you're fighting Usyk. The problem is that implies that Usyk's opponent has the foot speed to back Usyk up without throwing punches. Now Tyson Fury does. But Tyson Fury has a problem with coordinated, slick boxers who can move, which is exactly who Usyk is. I don't believe Anthony Joshua has the confidence to hunt a guy down like that, right? The kind of boxer in history who would, outside of Joe Fraser, for example, would be a Jack Dempsey or a Mike Tyson. You don't have that right now in the heavyweight division. The closest thing you have is Derek Chisora. So pay close attention, close attention to Alexander Usyk. I don't care who has the belts. This man is one of the most dangerous men on the planet. Understand, too, he's on borrowed time. Ali moved a lot in his early 20s, right? When he beats Liston, he says, look at me, I'm 22 years old, right? He's 22 when he beats Liston. By the time we're in the 70s and Ali's in his 30s, right? Ali's rope-a-doping, Ali has cut down on the volume. You'll notice here, Usyk, a great athlete, is still moving around, but as boxing old-timers know, the legs are the first to go. They're the first to go. So what I think is going to happen is these clunky guys are going to try to wait until Usyk's 36, 37. Even though heavyweights age more slowly than everyone else. This is a heavyweight relying on his legs. So I believe the big three are going to try to shut him out. Right? Wilder is back saying, hey, Fury, come on, fight me. Right? Now that the contract has expired for Wilder to sign up for the third fight, Wilder, of course, has some hair on his chest and is saying, hey, Fury, fight me. Right? Knowing Fury's under no contractual obligation to do so. Right? Fury's talking about fighting Joshua. Joshua's talking about how he loves a WBC belt. He wants to fight Fury. Fight fans, you're going to have to call these guys out. Right? You're going to have to start to say, hey, wait a player, can you beat Alexander Usyk? You know how these fighters pub the fights they have coming up? Right? If Fury signs to fight Joshua and the guys are at some cheesy press conference talking and stuff like that, the boxing press needs to say, hey, is the winner going to fight Usyk? If not now, can you give us a timetable when that fight's going to come off? 
right? Because understand, they represent the old guard. There are mobile fighters. Michael Hunter comes to mind. Joseph Parker, who's fighting Junior Fa, comes to mind. Right? Even Junior Fa is more fluid than Joshua and Wilder. Right? Boxing's a young man's game. I'm just telling you. Last year is last year. This year is this year. Next year is going to be next year. Right? This big clunky era. The big three who've dominated the heavyweight division now for years. Let's remember, Wilder was heavyweight champ for a five-year stretch. Let's remember, Fury beats Vladimir Klitschko. Right? Another guy who was big and a bit clunky more than five years ago. Right, folks? The old guard is being challenged. Movement and aggression and foot speed might soon rule the day. Alexander Usyk is the mockingbird of the heavyweight division. Once you see the foot speed of him against Chisora, you understand. Wilder better not fight this guy. He's not going to be stationary long enough for Wilder to land that right hand. Right, Joshua, better not fight this guy. Joshua's a great puncher. If a boxing match breaks out, he loses. If Joshua starts moving, Usyk can move with him. With a boxing game. Right, understand too, the whole lefty thing. Right, guys who, it changes the angles completely. Guys who hope to tap you with their left hand before throwing a right hand, suddenly the angle's different. They'll have a harder time landing that jab. Right? They're accustomed to clunky opponents, not movers. Right? So, Alexander Usyk just had one of the hardest fights he could have at heavyweight. Derek Chisora came in in shape and motivated, took the early rounds. Right, folks, I'm just telling you that if he fought Joshua, the fight wouldn't be that difficult. Joshua was in the arena, Olympic gold medalist himself. Joshua was in the arena, saw the fight. He's talking about fighting someone else. Right, as I said, I don't blame him. Right, unification matches, it's hard to accuse a guy of dodging you when he's dodging you to fight a heavyweight unification title match. Okay. Okay, that's fine. But nobody's in a rush in the heavyweight division to fight Usyk. Right? Daniel Dubois has said, look, once I get by Joe Joyce, he thinks he's getting by Joe Joyce. I'm not that sure. But once I get by Joe Joyce, I'd have no problem fighting Usyk. Right? If I'm Usyk, since Dubois doesn't have a belt, right? Why would I fight a young lion like that? when I could just wait to fight the big clunky guard of the heavyweight division and put myself in a position to take home a title. Understand, if Joshua doesn't fight Usyk, and Usyk's the mandatory, right, Usyk might end up with that belt. Just food for thought. Also, consider Dubois in his early 20s to be part of the next wave in the heavyweight division. Let me close by saying this, and I know it's controversial. Roy Jones and Mike Tyson are upset, right? Um, the boxing commission out here decided, hey, we're going to make the rounds in this fight two round, uh, two minute rounds, right? So these guys are pissed off. They're like, hey, come on. That's women's boxing. That's not men's boxing, right? Um, let me make two points here. First, women should fight three-minute rounds. Quite frankly, I think there's some women out there who can beat some guys. Right? That's the first thing. The second thing, though, and it's important, is understand the enemy of a lot of these older fighters, and Jones and Tyson, I believe, are both in their 50s, right? The enemy is stamina. There's a big difference between a two-minute round and a three-minute round. 
we've all seen rounds where your guy looks great for the first two minutes. You're like, oh, he's won this round. Then suddenly in the last 30 seconds, oh, life is different. Didn't Ray Leonard steal some of those rounds against Marvin Hagler in the last 30 seconds of the round? I love the two-minute round because, quite frankly, if Mike Tyson walks through Roy Jones, as I think he's going to, right? Two-minute rounds, three-minute rounds, doesn't matter to me. I think Mike Tyson walks through him. I believe that Mike Tyson, with that kind of hand speed, understand old guys still keep it together for the first few minutes. I believe he might be able to come out and surprise an Usyk. Surprise a Joshua. Right? Why can't we have exhibitions where it's two-minute rounds and these older guys are actually coming after some of these young fighters? Understand, hand speed is almost like a jump shot. The guys with blinding hand speed are still fast. Right? You don't you don't see a guy who had blinding hand speed who suddenly is in the ring and looks like he's molasses. Maybe the reflexes are gone, but not the hand speed. I'd be shocked if Mike Tyson today doesn't have faster hand speed than Anthony Joshua. You make it a two-minute round. Think about how Tyson lost some of his fights, right? He looks tired against Danny Williams. Right? These guys, you know, can't go three minutes. Well, if you make it a two-minute round, folks, you might be in the eighth round before the older fighter starts to tire. Suddenly, the fight becomes dramatic. Right? You make two-minute rounds the standard for fighters over 45 or over 50. Right? And suddenly... These older fighter against younger fighter exhibitions could become really exciting. You could even have a two-minute round belt for fighters over 45 years old. Right? Let's look at this Roy Jones-Mike Tyson fight. Let's see if there are any flashes of their former selves where you say, my God, Roy Jones still has hand speed. That right hand is still cat quick, right? Understand, older fighters have the experience. They have the know-how. You change the format a little bit, and the fight's suddenly competitive, right? If Mike Tyson cuts off the ring the way Mike Tyson used to, and understand, in some of his losses, he's winning the fight. He's beating Danny Williams, before he runs out of gas and then starts getting hit with big shots, gets dropped in the fight, right? If you set it up so it's harder for these older guys to run out of gas and you're dealing with the older fighters know-how, right? Evander Holifield is suddenly up in your grill. You can't find his head. He's blocking your upper shots. He's countering you to death. Those fights could be dramatic. I like the two-minute round idea for older fighters. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.